I am Araceli, a wealth advisor, real estate investor in the United States and Canada, and creator of Wealthy Women in Real Estate. Every week, I meet with Colette, a real estate broker and a real estate investor in Canada. We come together to talk about all things real estate investing and how to increase your wealth. Join us. Welcome everyone. This is Araceli, wealth advisor and real estate investor in the U.S. and Canada. And in my chat with Colette today, we have a very interesting subject that we haven't touched up in a while. Colette, can you introduce yourself and let us know how you uh, came up with this? I of course. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Please don't forget to subscribe and like and comment and ask us lots of questions. Please, please, please. Uh, my name is Colette Rabba. I am a residential real estate broker in the GTA. And... Uh, I also, sorry, I'm distracted because I, I wanted to say how this whole uh, show came about. Um, so as you may or may not know, I have an STA or a short-term accommodation. This is the background of my Airbnb, if you'd like to call it that, or, you know, VRBO, whichever term you want to use. It's a short-term accommodation. Basically, that's how we are categorized, not a long-term rental, but a short-term rental. So in, in Prince Edward County, and uh, I went to a council meeting last night because they were talking about how to regulate. They've been working on this for two years before COVID, and they still haven't figured it out because the county, as you may or may not know, relies on tourism. So in a lot of places, not just vacation places, but New York, Toronto, any big city, there is a large population of tourists, France, in, you know, Paris, Germany, any big city, but also smaller cities. And this happens to be a very small community. And it seems like the people that are in Prince Edward County don't really know how to, I shouldn't say people, I should say government, knows really how to regulate or to uh keep keep them keep everybody happy let's say it that way and when i came home you know i was texting araceli through the whole thing and i'm and i'm saying oh my god this and that and this is crazy and oh my gosh and she said something like yeah it's very similar in whatever at, at toronto cleveland hamilton whichever city you want to do because the government is is elected by us, the people, right? Well, how do we you know? Right. I hope that we are, you know, we're not we're not gonna get into conspiracy theories. Yeah. But when it really comes down to saying, okay, the, certain things started coming up in the meeting. One of the things was housing crisis. We don't want short-term accommodations because they are taking away from long-term accommodations or long-term housing for the local people. So this was sort of the underlying theme of the whole meeting, even though that wasn't really the reason for this meeting. Now, that started to, you know, tick something off in my head. And I thought, this is crazy. And I, it's not the first time I've heard it, but I kind of just push it away because it's something that, you know, maybe I'm not worried about being homeless, but my children definitely can't afford to buy anything, but they can afford to live. But it's so different in, in all these different places where we could live. And to think about, this is not, so, so anyway, I came home, <clears throat> you know, the thought process was there. It was really late. It was a four hour meeting, which should never be a council meeting. <laughs> it should never be that long. It's government. So what do you expect? Right. But it's also because the way, and this is the other thing too, this is local government. So this is council. This is not national or, or you know, bigger than the province. This is very, very local government. And this is who generally regulates short-term accommodation, long-term accommodation, all that stuff. In real estate too, if you are an investor, there's something else called the LTA, which is the Landlord-Tenant Act and the Landlord-Tenant Board. 
So those things, if you are going to be a, a, a landlord or a tenant, you should be very well versed on the act. That's a whole other story, but I just wanted to put together four little things. And this is only part one of four, oh, sorry, part one of two parts. Yeah. We could probably talk about it for four parts, but let's just keep it simple. I tried to keep it as simple as possible just to not talk about it forever and ever, because I know this is something that it's nothing new. It's not just a local problem. It's a global problem, if not at least a, a Ontario problem or Canadian problem. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure it's global. I think that what is happening, Colette, is that the laws don't catch up quickly enough. And because the dynamic of economics have changed in the last two years, now we have people that are working from home, that they're looking for maybe uh, bigger properties that they could live outside the city. Uh, there's so much change in uh, jobs right now. Right. Um, so and you know what? Sorry, I just want yeah. to say something else too. It's actually, to look at it as a negative is, I think this is wonderful. I think COVID has made people realize that we have a finite time on this planet. And why don't we do something that we love? So in order, so let's just pretend this is me. In order for me because I, I like to, you know, I don't want to pick on anybody, but let's just say I can't afford to live in the GTA because it's very, very expensive. What else am I going to do? I'm going to move out to, let's say, Prince Edward County because it's beautiful here and I can become the artist that I wanted to become or the farmer or whatever typical thing I can't do in the city, right? <laughs> so I moved to the county. Where am I going to live? There is nothing that is not cheaper, but even affordable for me to live even in, you know, two hours outside of Toronto or three hours outside of Toronto. How far do I have to go to get affordable housing? And then what? I don't have a place to work because there's no industry out here. Yeah. So it's this, you know, domino effect. If you want to say, you're right, the government has a lot to do with it, but how do we solve this crisis? Well, that is exactly it. So I think it's it's a matter of adjusting. Everybody, first of all, need to understand what the new economic is. And then the government also needs to adjust. And you know that the government doesn't adjust quick enough. Right. And that's why all of these issues are arising. So Right. And the one thing I know this is not new to people who actually go to council meetings, but I just wanted to say... It was very interesting, again, and every time I do, I, I try to go to different council meetings, especially when it has to do with housing or uh, the landlord-tenant board, uh, anything like that. When I have time, I, I try and go, even though I want to like kill myself, I'm never going to be a politician, mark my words, um, <laughs> because it's very, you have to, you know, there, there are certain people who say the government is nothing and they do nothing and da da da, but honestly, I think that the, the politicians or, you know, the, the council basically what they want to do is keep everyone safe. So if you look back in the 70s to see before the LTA became a thing, how people were living, <laughs> you know, even in the 50s, 60s, what kind of slumlords, why is that a term even? Yeah. You know, there were tenants, or sorry, there were tenants that were not being taken care of that could not have a voice, that did not have a voice. And you'll see, you know, in the States too, how different uh, tenanting is and how much easier it is to get tenants out. But this is what's happened. It's hard to have a balance. So either you balance out for the landlord side or you balance out on the, for you know, it, to tenants. keep the tenancy. So it's very difficult in that respect, but that's a whole other thing. So, so I put together uh, four things, actually I put together eight things. So this is part one. We're going to talk about a little bit. I'm going to share my screen if that's okay. Yeah. Um, just to talk about it, because, you know, if, if it is something that you're really uh, uh, passionate about or curious about, then this is something for you. So hopefully you'll, you'll comment and you'll, you'll take a look and either disagree or disagree. Please absolutely disagree. I would love to hear your points. This is something that uh, you kind of, when you're in this meeting, you kind of feel helpless because of the government has to step in. They have to do something to help us. 
And if it's something that really concerns you, I absolutely agree that it's not just a government problem. And it's also not a problem, like it's not solely a problem for the people that live in that area. We have to work together to solve it. So these are a couple of things. So just to let you know, if you've been living under a rock, <laughs> housing prices have skyrocketed worldwide, not just in Canada, but let's just say local. Let's just keep it local. But as you know, <laughs> or you may not know, housing prices have skyrocketed worldwide for the past few decades. And who's getting impacted is the youngest generation when they're coming up in their you know, 20s, 30s to be able to afford something where they want to live, yeah. not where they have to live. Yeah, because so. now the problem, Colette, is that it's not so much that the houses have gone up, but the salaries haven't gone up at the same rate. You've been saying that for years. And yeah, but the problem is that, you know what, everybody's trying to live with the same salary so therefore we're not going to be able to do it right so the more that we need to do here is to look for other sources of income and that's why but see that's piece, right and we can argue about that too because why would people have to have a side hustle why do people have to have rental units in their own yeah. house it's because we can't afford to live ourselves and we make a half decent living yeah it's nuts anyway so the problem, if you don't know what we're talking about today, a national <laughs> problem. Let's just call it a national problem over the last two years because COVID kicked us in the butt when it comes to this, right? Like yeah. things have changed. People weren't a lot, you know, like it, it's all a perfect storm where people like secretly did stuff because, you know, government offices weren't open. Yeah. And so, so anyway, so basically, and because everything has gone up, inflation has gone through the roof. Um, you know, supply chain, blah, 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 all that stuff. It's just like one big perfect storm. And now we're in it. And what do we do about it? Right? So typical home prices in Canada, which I didn't know this, across the country is yeah. over $800,000. Yeah. Americans, are you listening? <laughs> so let's go to the second page. I just have a really quick little thing here. So these are four creative ideas. Well, not creative. I think they're just four simple ideas that I'm sure governments, general people know about this. But just to let you guys know if, you, if this is a concern or you want to be concerned about it and do something about it, maybe one of these things will trigger something inside of you and say, oh, yeah, you know what? I could really, I could really lobby again or, or for this. I really want to do something about this. So number one. You know, I have a problem with some government. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to say that, but, you know, it's, it's something that whenever I want to go to the city to say, hey, I would like to build a deck. Oh, my God. It's, it's crazy. It's very difficult for a simple thing like that. I have tons of paperwork. You have to do the drawings. You have to do this. You have to do that. And then they send you go to the bylaw office. You give them the papers. They're like, no, nope. you have to go back and forth, back and forth. So that's just not the type of person I am. But let's talk about rezoning for a moment. So rezoning, when you buy a house, it's zoned. Let's say R1 is for one family. That's what, that's, you know, they're, they're all a little different zoning, uh, um, uh, the, the, what they call it, how the government has their little um, codes. So let's just say for a single family, it's zoned R1. And this is something when you are buying a house, you should ap absolutely ask your realtor. And if they can't answer this for you, run away from them. Get a new realtor. <laughs> they should be able to answer that one question. And why is it important? Yes, I'm just buying a single family dwelling. But guess what? What if I want to put a second floor on it, have a multi-family you know, family, uh, units? The zoning, you're going to have to go to the city and ask to be rezoned. So this is something that if you are interested, let's say I have a nice property, I want to rezone it, even if I have a single family dwelling and I want to renovate it to be multiple floors and have those other units rented. And all I need, I'm a single person, all I need is one floor. I'm perfectly happy. I want to stay in my area. Rezoning laws are very important. And that's something that you can go to your local government and ask them. I like, I, I don't want rezoning on my property, but I want you to change the laws and make it easier for people to get and maybe even free 
to get your property rezoned. Renovating is very expensive. Spend the money on renovating to put a second uh, unit in your house or on your property. So this is the thing. What do you think of rezoning? Well, I agree with a lot of the things you said. However, in certain areas, which is more, I would say urban, and that people would like to just have a single family home, a lot of people don't want to have um, a, a concentration of people. In one of the cities, for example, it's in, in Brampton, if you're not yeah. familiar with yeah. it, but it's close to Mississauga. And there is uh, lots of bigger houses and there's two, three, four families living in it. And what is happening in this city is the prices are down, uh, insurances is up. So you wanna have a balance depending on where you are. So I think it is, yeah, it's easier to do a little bit more rezoning, but at the same time, they have to kind of keep an eye on how far you wanna go with it, right? Right, and that's the, that's the trick. We, it's out of our hands as homeowners or as citizens, this is a government thing and these are just ideas to say yeah you know in the right areas or maybe not maybe in in you know very rural places too we can rezone to have multiple dwellings on a property exactly. too but is there and this you know and this is the thing you always have to remember it's a domino effect so here you go yes i will do this multi-generate multi-family dwelling but you're in the middle of nowhere, there's no industry. So why yeah. do it there if there's no jobs? So this is all tied together with multiple things, multiple layers. So the next thing that I really like is being creative with housing. And I think this is also a government sort of thing, but also a private sector thing, where if you can share accommodations with someone, and that's happening already, you'll see... Yeah. Uh, seniors um, opening up their homes to um, younger people and they can do a combination of rent plus help. So they help around the house, they do the lawn, they do the dishes, maybe paint a room every once in a while, maybe declutter. Like these are the things that between the homeowner and the younger person, um, and that's, the, that's also number three. So to help seem, uh, sorry, the, it sort of goes hand in hand too with number three, where helping seniors sell their home now, have a little money in their pocket, but they don't have to move. So they can either live with the new homeowner or um, you know, have, a, have the homeowner segregate the house to, to have them in one unit. And, then, and that's the new owner's responsibility to have this purchase, not with a uh, vacant possession, so this is also a very legal thing, but it can absolutely be done now. This is something we can do now. Mm -hmm. So as a real estate agent, if I had a senior and they asked me, hey, I want to sell my house because I need some money, but I don't want to move. What do I do? So there are options there. So number two, I think is very exciting to me. And we see this already in some cities mm -hmm. where they've taken a commercial space, an empty commercial space, like an old school. Or like a, like a plaza, like a little mall. And they've changed it into housing. I've seen it yeah. into seniors housing. I think it's fantastic. But That's who, actually, yeah, a great idea. Because, you know, now, especially after COVID, there was a lot of people that, and a, a lot of small businesses that they moved entirely into their home. Because right. they have two or three employees. There's really no need for an office. And they can work remotely. So now there's going to be a lot more commercial space coming. Available, right. And it's going to be available. So why not make use of it? Right. Absolutely. So, and that's the other thing too. Or you have a house that you can convert and get the laws and, and be able to get those permits to have your, and that goes back to number one, to rezone your house. Yeah. It's, it's still called rezoning to instead of having it just residential, but also residential commercial. So you are legally allowed to work in your house as a therapist or a doctor or whichever, you know, what you're comfortable in doing in your own home. Yeah. So that also has to do with rezoning. So number three, just to keep things moving, 
is financial incentives. So the local government is something is some is the body to be able to incentivize homeowners, seniors, parents by offering a break on either property taxes or renovating uh, a property to house more people um, when renting rooms to a younger demographic. So it can be very, very specific to uh, what we really need. And, and if we're talking about the younger population not being able to afford housing, I think this is a very easy way to do it. As a parent of kids that are in their 20s, I would love that. <laughs> like if, if I could let my kids stay with me but I need a little bit of money too. Like I, maybe I can't afford to stay in my area because of X, Y, and Z. COVID really hit my business hard. Whatever those things are that are going through your life and you have children, maybe your children got sick through COVID and didn't recover. They had these plans to go to school, go to work, go travel, and now they can't, they're still at home. When is it the responsibility of the parent to say, Time's up. You got to go. <laughs> yeah. exactly. and you know or you have to contribute. Yeah. I remember, you know, when I was growing up at 18, pretty much everybody was out of the house. And, right. right. And they couldn't wait. And you you get a, just a whatever job and you were able to afford an apartment on your own. And it was kind of exciting to do that. But now, right. no matter what you work, even if you have a really good job, you're still at home. I think that's a very a, a detrimental thing for younger generations. Right. First of but all, it, because they keep attached to the parent and they are still dependent and don't grow up enough to do all, everything on their own. So I think that is something that needs to right. change. And well, uh, this housing thing is not uh, helping, right? No, and it's, and it's far reaching too, because it's not like, I'm not saying that about my own kids, but let's just say, you know, you, you have your financial goals as a, as a person, and now I've calculated my money. Um, you know, this is how much I have to spend on food. This is how much I have to spend on housing till the kids are whatever in their 20s. And then that should be my break. Now should be the time that I get a break from them, that I can do what I want. I want to travel. I want to go do things. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm secure and I'm enough in my life, in my job, and everything else, that I have different goals. And I've set my goals specifically because my kids were of a certain age and I could have that freedom. Yeah. Now, because of COVID, because of the economy, it's hard for them. I love them. Of course, they're my kids. I don't want to get rid of them. I don't want to kick them out. I want to support <laughs> them. But when is it going to be? And, you know, we all know people who their kids have moved back. Maybe it's even you that you've moved back with your family when you're in your 30s, 40s, God forbid, 50s. Yeah. But that's the way of life these days, unfortunately, because of the economy, because of um, prices in, in housing. And it's really, it's how you slice it. It's how you look at it to say, okay, how can we fix this? How can we help these younger people? So I'm not just saying the parents are responsible for their kids, but let's just say there is a nice lady next door and her house is completely empty and she needs help. She's an older woman. She needs to have somebody care for her and just have eyes on her. But this is the other thing about, too, uh, about this. It's not just financial incentives. It's also a government um, help because we're not all landlords. We don't know what we're looking at. We don't know when we meet someone to say, oh yeah, I want to live with you. Exactly. How? How do you know if that person's lifestyle is going to mesh with yours? Well, that it creates a totally different problem, Colette. Because right. even leaving with somebody that you like, sometimes it's difficult, right? Absolutely. So, so you do you need your... Integrate yeah, you, with somebody else new and then right. adapt to what, whatever they do. We all have quirks that, you know, you may not right. like. And everybody needs privacy uh, to some, you know, there's got to be private spaces that you both respect each other to say, I'm not going to come into your private space, but don't, you know, do crazy stuff like, you know, raising cockroaches or something. <laughs> you know, that's not, that's not, not good. So yeah, it's a long conversation, but why I wanted to talk about it was because the government, um, even with the landlord and tenant act, they still don't help new landlords understand how to be a good landlord yeah. or a tenant to understand how to be a good tenant. 
so these are things that, you know, we all want to respect each other. Ultimately, that's the, the underlying theme for that. But to have government um, help with that. So, so to have courses about being a landlord or how to talk to people. There are so many people that I've been on uh, calls with who are landlords. And I'm like, did you do this? And they're like, no. I'm like, that's like the first thing you should have done. Or I don't want to get into it. It's too long. But this is the thing. People think, oh, I'm just going to get, I need the money. I need the money. I'm just going to get somebody to live with me for a short term. And then they can't get them out. So to keep those landlords safe is a huge thing for me. I try my best when I have people call me after the fact, when they have a bad tenant, for me to help them get them out. And how do you do it? I'm not a paralegal. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm a real estate agent that knows tenants and I know people. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm not going to go on that tangent, but I think it's important that there is some kind of governing body that helps people become good landlords and to ask those questions and to be able, how do you, how do you teach instinct? You can't. So that's why you hire people like me to pick the tenants for you. <laughs> anyway, so the last thing I have today is government policy. I think government policy is huge and it's about who we vote for. And if this concerns you, this is something before you elect someone, you have to have that conversation, especially council, especially local government. They're very, you can, you can talk to them. It's not that they're not, um, you can't have conversations with them, especially in your area. You should be able to pick up the phone, make a phone call and say, I'd like to talk to you. You are my counselor, my area counselor. I want to talk to you about this. What are we going to do about this housing crisis and see what they have to say and pick someone based on that or just ask those questions so you know who you're electing. So in, in this is just one example about saying government policy is blanket. It's a blanket statement. But one thing that they can do is regulate for every new condos. There are condos coming up like nuts, crazy. I don't even know enough in my area. I know there are certain things with, with builders and developers that they have to do something for the government, like, um, like build a park or have green space. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if this is policy, if for every new condo, they need to have a percentage go towards affordable housing. So I don't know enough about to talk about that, but that's just one of the things when I say government policy should change, there should be rules about bigger things like that. Yeah. When it comes to um, us all working together, that's my underlying theme here is it's not, and, and this is the thing, in the council session yesterday, it was like the councilors were bullying the people that were there because we wanted to talk about short-term accommodation. It was the first on the agenda and they motioned to put it last. Whoa. So that was one big thing. So there was about 12 or 14 people that actually had to leave because it took four hours. We got out of there at 11 p.m. So it's just a lot of red tape for what I can see. Absolutely. And you know, at the end of the day, we all have to pitch in a little bit to try to understand what is going on and what we can do as citizens to make this a little bit better. But yeah, you know, like, I think this is going to take a while for the government to catch up. But yeah. these ideas are fantastic, Colette. And Thanks. remember to watch uh, part two, which is going to be next week. And uh, so you can see the other four ideas but I think that if everybody becomes aware of what is happening and do just a little bit to understand what is going on, we can all get better and understand right. better. And this you know what? To be honest, I think I was a tenant. I'm sure you were a tenant. We were all there. So I, I, when I talk to tenants, I really feel for them. I understand. But you have to know everybody... It's like finding a partner. Everybody has the right person. Everybody might not match. So what I, the one little tip I can give people who want to become landlords or think about having a tenant, 
write down your wish list of who magically is your ideal tenant because that person exists, if I can say it out loud. <laughs> that yeah. person actually exists. Well, that is one of the things that most people need to focus on. First of all, the reason that they don't find the right tenant is because they just say, I want a tenant. A tenant could be anything, right? Men, woman, family, yeah. Yeah. young people, Six people, with people. Ten dogs. No, no, no. Exactly. Like, yeah. So yeah. If, the more specific you get, the better off you're going to be. And it's the same when you're looking for a property. It's the same when you're looking for a partner, for anything. The more you concentrate on the characteristics of that person or that thing that you want, the more you're going to get it. Absolutely. I agree 100%. All well right. said. <laughs> well, Colette, so thank you so much. And remember to watch the next episode. Also, if you are not a visual person, I'd like, to, or maybe you are on the road and would like to hear the episode, you can also subscribe to the podcast. So we will see you in the next episode. Thank you, Colette. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you for being here on the show. Please remember to subscribe and hit the notification bell to get notified when there are more shows available. And if you would like to have more information on how to start investing in real estate, please visit my website at www.arisalihernandez.com. Thank you.